Coming up on the Just Fantasy Baseball podcast, Vince and I gave you everything second base from rankings, top 10. Who are some of the sleepers? Who are some of the prospects you could look out for this year? In depth, from top to bottom, an hour-long episode all about second base for how you can win your fantasy baseball league with second baseman. It's a valuable position. It's a deep position. There's a lot to talk about. We got into all that, all that, and a whole lot more coming up next on the Just Fantasy Baseball podcast. Stay tuned. Welcome back to Just Fantasy Baseball. My name is Rami Lavi. This is episode two with Vince D'Amato. Vince, how are you doing today? Great, Rami. Episode two, second base. I'm excited for it. I'm ready to dive in. We got some rankings, got some players we're going to touch on. Can't wait. When I said second base, because I kind of just threw it out there because I want to start with a random position uh, and felt like if we started with the outfield or with shortstop or something like that, it would have been, I don't know, not random enough or starting pitcher. I didn't realize it was going to be episode two, second base correlates perfect. So that works out perfectly. If you had to give a quick preview of second base, an overview, if you will, uh, what would that be? I think second base, there's a lot of options. There's a lot of ways that you can go. Typically, we're used to seeing second base fall off pretty quickly. And it does once you get around, you know, the top 20 or so, top 25, there's quite a bit of a drop off. But there's quite a few options for especially players who play in 12 team leagues. If you don't get one of the top guys or some of these guys that we'll talk about today, uh, you I have no problem waiting and kind of grabbing a guy late for some upside or just some floor play. So lots of uh, lots of options in second base. So I want to do and here's how we're going to break down this episode. We will do a top 10, but I want to hold the top 10 for a little bit. I want to first get into all of our. Uh, I, We'll go through a few categories, sleepers, worst value, best value on base percentage. We'll talk about some of that and we'll give you some names that you can look at and then we'll round it out with our top 10. Then we have a couple of other things for you. So let's start it off. Start here with guys who are going to get on base slash average. Now, it depends what kind of league you're in. If you're in an on base league or if you're in a batting average league, obviously that makes a big difference. Now, some of these guys are good at both. Who do you have if it's an on-base league? Who do you have if it's an average league? What are you looking at at second base for guys? Let's say you're in a draft and you need on-base. You have your home runs. You have your stolen bases. Now you just need somebody who's going to get on. Who do you have? Um, By and far, I think Edder Julian. He's the second baseman for the uh, Minnesota Twins, and now he gets to step into that role without uh, Jorge Polanco um, getting traded to Seattle. Definitely Edder Julian. He has extremely high walk rates. He never walked less than 18% in his minor league career. He put up a 15% last year in his um, in his stint. So he's going to hit at the top of the order. He hits the ball pretty hard. I mean, he's not going to flash 30 homer and power. He's not going to steal 30 bases, but I think 20 for both of those is a reasonable expectation. And he's going to get on. I wouldn't be surprised if he got on a 370, 380 clip. And that's going to be huge at the top of a pretty good twins lineup. It's going to score a lot of runs. So Ed R. Julian is one that definitely sneaks into the to the top 10 in an OBP league that maybe you don't see in a lot of average leagues. So he's definitely one in an OBP league that I target. And if you're looking at batting average, where would you go? Batting average, I think my my best value would probably be... Is that what we're doing? Are we doing best value or just kind of general? Like I would say... No, I would say who's the best batting average guy for you? Yeah. Like top guy. Top of top the line. Guy. Top, well, top guy is Mookie Betts. I mean, number one, he yep. is the best. He is in tier one of his own. I nicknamed it the God tier because he's going top five in drafts, and I think that's where he should be going. Um, he just he does everything really well. He's not going to steal 30 bases, but 15 stolen bases and 35 home runs, and he's going to hit 300. And I mean, you're talking 100 plus runs in RBIs. So, I mean, would he have 120 runs last year? He is definitely the number one dude for average leagues if you can get him now what's interesting about Mookie is that yes he's a second baseman he could also he's eligible most leagues outfield he's eligible at shortstop in some leagues so Mookie Betts is a guy who not only do you want him because he's the best player across the league this is a guy who is also just 
eligible everywhere and eligibility matters so much. Now we'll see what happens this year. If he could lose eligibility as the season goes on, if he's exclusively playing second base, but it depends on how your league works. Some leagues don't readjust the eligibility in the middle of the season at all. And you're looking at a guy that you could plug in anywhere. And that's helpful. How much do you look at guys being eligible in different positions when you're drafting? Yeah, that's huge. And again, it, it will depend a lot on the context of your league. So um, let's think of an example here, right? If you have second base shortstop, like most, you know, like law leagues do, and then you also have say middle and corner infield, a guy who's second base and third base eligibility is huge because not only do they get second base and middle infield, but they also get that corner infield spot. So trying to find guys who can be as flexible as possible is really going to help, especially because it's unfortunate, but every team deals with injuries. Just having that extra depth or having that extra roster flexibility is huge. Um, one of the guys that maybe we can touch on a little bit later is Luis Renjifo. He is quad eligible, so his second base, shortstop, third base, and outfield. That's huge. I'm going to be drafting him in a lot of leagues this year. I think he's very valuable. So, um, yeah, I mean, that's a good call out because we see a lot of these second baseman guys are also shortstop eligible or um, outfield eligible. So definitely keep that in mind as you draft. Forget about injuries for a second. You have so many Mondays and Thursdays where you're scrambling to fill a roster out, it feels like, right? And there are not enough games across the league to fill out your full roster. Having guys who can switch multiple positions, and that way you're not having to drop someone on your on your bench and pick up someone off waivers just for a Monday or a Thursday is huge. And now you can fill in a roster and at least have something presentable. And forget about presentable with Mookie. He's the best guy in the league. Like, this is something that, to me, he's the highest value. Now, when we get to the outfield and we get to our top 10s and our top 100 list or whatever we do, however we break down our tier list, I think Ronald Acuna, we talked about him on episode one, is maybe number one still across the board. I saw in some projections, he's projected to go like for $59 and the next best player isn't projected to go for more than 43 when you're talking about auction league. So that's the gap there, right? Obviously, when you look at a regular draft and it's one and two, you don't see that gap between one and two. The fact that there's a $13 difference and what, 20 something percent difference in cost value for uh, a for a, an auction league between two guys is crazy yet i still think mookie bets when you look at the numbers and you look at the eligibility and you figure he's going to be in that dodger lineup which is absolutely loaded and they're going to be winning a ton of games i don't see how he's not the most valuable guy or at least one of the most valuable guys in fantasy baseball right now yeah yeah i agree i mean i I can't beat Acuna's 40 70. I don't think even Mookie <laughs> yet. Yeah, no one that, unfortunately. So, um, yeah, I mean, you know, once you get past Ronald Acuna, if somebody really wanted Mookie bets and wanted to take him two overall, I, I'm not going to scoff at it. I mean, I, I would personally take like a Bobby Witt or Corbin Carroll over him, but then, I mean, there it's, there's so much flexibility in that top tier that, because we never know how some of these young guys, you know, maybe they go through a sophomore or junior slump and, but Mookie's been doing it for a long time. And so, you know, that you're going to get consistency out of him. So I think that's a good call out. If you want safety in that first round, I think you can't do any better than Mookie Betts. Another guy who's been doing it for a long time, and maybe his name flies a little under the radar at this point now. And I love him for batting average and for on-base percentages, Jose Altuve. This guy, for some reason, the last couple of years, his average and his on-base has climbed. Now, he has missed games, and so that's where the caveat comes in, where it's like, all right, if he's not going to play a full season, maybe you start to worry about that. But 311 and 393 average and on-base percentage, which is uncharacteristically high for him a little bit. But then again, you think about this guy's always been a 200 hits guy. He does swing a lot, so generally you don't think of him as a high walk guy, but he's also little, got a tiny strike zone. So I love Jose Altuve. I think he's transitioning at a point in his career where he's probably just going to try and get on base more, try and get more hits. He's not trying to be a big thumper in the middle of that lineup. Obviously, they have those guys with Alvarez and everyone else. I think this could be another year where he's more focused on just bat the ball, get on base, and he could still pop a few out and hit a couple and steal a bunch of bases where he's not hurting you in those categories. And it makes his average and his on base percentage really valuable for you if you're going to draft a guy like Jose Altuve. Yeah, and I'm actually I'm curious as to your thoughts. So we just saw Jose sign a big contract this offseason, right? And he's 33 years old and having the smaller frame, right? It doesn't take much of a decline physically for him to stop hitting home runs or, you know, to, to his 
for his fantasy value to really fall off the table. And I know people have been predicting that for years and it just hasn't happened. What are your thoughts when a guy signs a big contract? Do you think there's any sort of like mental just kind of lapse, whether it's conscious or unconscious of just like, okay, now I'm secure. I don't have to go out and try to be the best anymore. I can just kind of take my foot off the pedal, even 10%. Would you be worried about that at all? Like Jose signing that big contract or are you, do you not think that that matters to him? It depends who you are. And because Jose Altuve, heart of a champion, that guy is a guy who's always been undersized, chip on his shoulder, fight for everything that he has. I don't think it applies to him. Now, if you're a, a young wide receiver in the National Football League where, you know, you got the bag and you you start taking plays off and you start blocking less, I get that. This isn't as physically a demanding sport. This isn't a, a, a superstar wide receiver or a diva or one of these this is a guy who has been the model of consistency and has built his game on i'm going to show up every day and work my butt off and work harder than you and that's how i'm going to get to where i need to go so i don't worry about it with altuve it's true with some guys you do and that's why the next guy i'm going to talk about in a contract year is huge for me like i'm i want if my whole fantasy team could be guys in contract years that would be awesome. Guys going into a year trying to get a contract sign. Give me that. Give me Pete Alonzo. Give me all these guys. Give me Juan Soto. I want all of them. But for Altuve, I think it doesn't apply just because, like I said, this is a guy who's always had this chip on his shoulder. This is a future Hall of Famer. This is a special guy. And you can talk about the cheating and all that stuff, but he's proven before and after that he's still going to be that great player. And uh, so I don't fear that with Altuve, but it's a good it's a good thing to talk about for other guys. Yes. Mm -hmm. That'd be an interesting, uh, interesting thing to kind of put together an all contract year team, a fantasy team. We got to, we got to do it. We'll do it before. That'd that'd be a good one. We'll do it before the season. We have to put together a list because, yeah, it's great. Like, you know, Shohei Otani, don't draft him. He just got the bag, you know, but (laughs) yeah, exactly. Juan Soto, Pete Alonso, and the next guy, because when we talk about best value and you have him ranked and he's ranked like I'm seeing him ranked somewhere between the seventh and 10th best second baseman. And when you look at his numbers, and this is why I mean by best value, when you look at his numbers for where you could get him in the draft, this guy is one of the top second basemen. I think he's inconsistent. Sure. But he had, he's 25 homers. He had 15 stolen bases. He batted over 270. This is a guy who can really be a solid help guy on your roster. And he's going to be in a good lineup this year. That's Glaber Torres of the Yankees in a contract year, yes, you're going to have weeks where you're pulling your hair out, where you're like, Glaber, what the hell? You bat 143 this week and you haven't done anything. I do that as a Yankee fan, but then he'll get on these hot streaks where he will just carry you for a month straight. And he looks like 2018 Glaber. He did it for a full year in 2018. I think we could see that. He's still so young. He's what, 26, 27 years old, going into a contract year. I think he might be younger, might be even 25. He's going into a contract year. He wants to get paid, whether it's by the Yankees or someone else. And he's in a lineup that should be pretty good with the addition of Juan Soto. Um, I love Glaber Torres. If you get him, we talk about the tiers. If you could get him in one of those three or four tiers, I still think he could give you top two tier value. So when you talk about value plays, I love Glaber Torres. Who do you got? Yeah, I think your Glaber, and real quick, I just want to touch on it because the thing that I love about Glaber is he cut his strikeout rate massively last year it went down to 14 percent and um i have written down the year before is 22 and a half percent so and that's with if you just watch him that's eliminating the leg stride he used to have that big leg kick and now with two strikes he's really focused on keeping that foot down and and just bat to ball skills and that's helped him yeah so his strikeout rate went down eight percent his walk rate went up four percent that's huge for a guy who you know is going to give you 20 plus home runs probably closer to 25 30 I don't think we ever see the 2019 Glaber where he hit 38 home runs. I don't think that's on the cards again, but if he hit 30 this year, I I know (laughs) if he hit 30 this year, I would not be shocked. He'll chip in. It's on some steals. He's going to hit for a high average. Um, Yeah. I think Glaber is a terrific call out and you're absolutely right. That offense is only getting better with Juan Soto. So I think that was a great call out. Um, My best ball era was legendary. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah. And that's actually something I want to touch on a little bit later, but um, yeah, my best value pick is Cattell Marte. I think that he is going to be, he is being pretty underdrafted. I think, um, let's see his draft right now. His ADP is 117 and Glaber's is 90. 
I think he belongs up there with um, Bryson Stott at about 105, 100. I think Cattell Marte is kind of being slept on. I think some injury concerns from the past are still kind of lingering. I mean, he's 30 years old, so I understand that. But he's on a terrific team, team that was just in the World Series. He's a veteran presence. He plays second base and, you know, tough position to fill sometimes. But he's going to hit for some power. He's going to steal, and he's going to hit for a good average. There's just a lot to like here for Cattell Marte. And, um, yeah, I, I just don't see why he's being drafted so low. The only thing I would be worried about is if those juice balls don't come back, maybe he doesn't, you know, obviously nobody's going to hit as many home runs, but I think he could be on that fringe, but he has a great exit velocity as average um, of 91 miles per hour last year, which is fantastic, especially for second base. He's got a great launch angle at 10 degrees, so um, almost 11 degrees. He's got a good strikeout to walk ratio of only minus 6%. He's just a phenomenal hitter. He's a great hitter. He's going to hit for some power, and I don't see many other consistent guys. I think Glaber and Cattell, two guys that we love at their ADP because they're consistent. You know what you're going to get out of them. And another thing with that is we just both talked about this. I love guys who are on good teams, I, and and that's in fancy across the board. Just the opportunity is there, and. At the end of the day, it's a game of numbers, right? And you're trying to get the most numbers. And if you have guys on base in front of you, if you guys have guys who are going to drive you in behind you, I mean, it's much better than watching a team that can't score and you're like, oh my God, my guy's doing his job, but no one around him is doing anything else. So sometimes there are great players who rise above it. I mean, you saw it with Shohei Otani. It felt like they could pitch around him if they really wanted to every time. And then every time there was no one on base, he would just hit a solo home run and that would be that. And he still put up his numbers, but... It's just so much better when you have a good team around you. And I think both those guys will benefit from having good teams around you. Now, we talked about the best value. This is the worst value. And that doesn't mean these guys aren't great players. That just means that for where you're going to get them in a draft, they might not be, you might not be getting all that on your return. So who do you have as your worst value at second base? Maybe stay away from his ADP. Yeah, staying away from the ADP is the important thing. Because I want to stress, I don't hate this player. Um, I think this player brings value, but... At their ADP of currently 114, so he's actually going in front of Cattell Marte, um, is Andres Jimenez. I just, I don't see why Jimenez is going as high as he is, especially because, and again, looking at the batted ball data, his EV, his exit velocity ticked up in 2022. He had a fantastic year, but last year it was the bottom 1% of the league. He was at 84.8 miles per hour. That is like, Asturi Ruiz, like you're not hitting the ball hard enough to really do any damage. He had a below average WRC plus. Um, he's just missing a lot of things in the batted ball data that kind of scare me. Yes, he's going to steal. He's got some speed. And he's also a fantastic glove, which is going to help. But not hitting the ball hard and he chases a lot too is another thing. I'm just not in on Andre Jimenez. I think he continues to fall this year. Maybe next year if he has a horrible year might be a good year to scoop him up but at his adp of 114 i am not touching him another guy who his adp just i don't love i think it's in the 120s and to me i think a lot of people who watch baseball and like baseball might think that he's this great player because when you watch baseball as a fan he gets hyped up across the league but unfortunately, in fantasy baseball, it's just not there for him. He's not worth having as a guy in Luis Arise. And again, great player. We know about the hits. We know about the batting average. It was all hyped up throughout the first half of the Major League season. But maybe let someone else make that mistake, buy into the hype and be like, oh, my God, this guy's still here with only nine second basemen off the board. Let me jump on him. Or even if there's 10 second basemen already off the board, let me jump on him. I'm telling you, that would be a mistake. He's a batting average guy and batting average alone. He doesn't steal bases. He doesn't hit for power. And not only that, if you're playing in a league that values total bases, which a lot of leagues count total bases, so you're looking for doubles, you're looking for triples, you're looking for home runs, he's really only hitting singles. That's a guy who is not going to get you a ton. And a 354 average jumps off the page. That's like, oh my God. But a 354 average, which is what you called an empty average, there's nothing else behind it. That could really end up hurting you in the long run. And so I would stay away from Luis Sarais, despite him being a great player and despite the hype that's around him in Major League Baseball. Yeah, and I think if you do a good enough job building your team, you don't you don't need a guy who's going to carry your batting average because having him 
yeah, it helps your batting average, but it's going to actively hurt you in power. It's going to actively hurt you in speed. And your counting stats aren't going to be that great either. He's not, you know, the Marlins aren't a team that's going to put, you know, top 10 scoring in baseball up. Like, they're just not going to do it. They don't have the offense for it. So, yeah, I agree with that. I think that's a phenomenal pick. And actually, when you put that on there, I was like, oh, how did I not how did I not think of that? But yeah, no, I think that was a phenomenal grab. And I actually see him going at 160 um, for his ADP. If I'm being honest, there's a lot of guys after him that I'd rather take. I think he should be falling into like the 225, 250 range. I think that's more of a fair place to go. Maybe 200, but you're absolutely right. I'm not touching him at his ADP. I was looking at Yahoo Sports. I guess it depends what you look at, obviously. Sure, sure. Yeah, right. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, all right. Now, sleepers. Now, sleepers could be anyone from guys who are going to make a big impact on your roster, guys who are high upside guys. And I think we kind of went in a few different directions with this. You had a few guys that were both. My guys were more strictly like, hey, I'm looking for high upside, straight up. Like these guys could, something could click for them, but you might not get anything out of them. Uh, who are you looking at as far as sleepers in the draft? And like I said, it ranges between guys who for their AZP are going to give you more value than what you're drafting or also guys who you might pick them up off waivers a week into the season and they might give you value period or have a really high upside. So who are you looking at? Yeah, I think the way that I, I interpret sleepers is guys that you typically pick up towards the end of the draft or maybe, you know, your last pick or or they're on waiver wires um, right when you start the season. But it just takes one little thing for them to really explode upwards. My first one is Nolan Gorman. Now, he has like prodigious power. Like the guy could be hitting 30, 35 home runs, which is huge at second base. I mean, it's just massive power that the guy has. But his one big problem is a 32% strikeout rate. Um, and it just makes him a streaky hitter. So if he's able to, whatever the tweak is that he needs to get to get there, I I just, I, I see it in him. He's only 23 years old, so he's still got plenty of time to kind of adjust. If he's able to figure that out, I see him as a top 100 pick next year. And so he's going currently in my NFBC at 191. If things click for him this year, he's going to be in the top 100 next year. I think Nolan Gorman is a sleeper um, by the definition I kind of made up in my head. And I think that kind of works for everyone else. Um, another one that I, I mentioned is Luis Renjifo. I talked about him a few moments ago. The quad eligibility is huge. Um, and he's a guy that I'm not crazy about the Angels, right? I think we tend to avoid guys on bad teams. Um, but not only does the quad eligibility kind of nullify that for me, but his power took a big step forward last year, and he had an EV of 89.1 miles per hour. He's a great hitter. He's not going to get you, you know, 25 home runs, but he's going to chip in a little bit of speed. Um, hit tool is okay. He's a guy, he's just going so late that I kind of can't ignore the fact of his quad eligibility, and he's going to play every day, right? The Angels aren't good enough to knock him. They don't really have anyone coming up in the system that's going to challenge him. So he should get 600 plate appearances. He should play every day and play in different positions and keep that eligibility. So um, hopefully that leads to some accumulation of 80 runs or RBIs um, approaching 90 and good average 15, 20 home runs, couple steals. I think that's a great value at, um, at pick 256. When you look uh, at eligibility, um, is it okay to look at, okay, this guy would be really valuable as a second baseman, but if I'm drafting him as an outfielder, he's less valuable or vice versa. Is that something that you think about when you look at that eligibility? Because eligibility certainly, and we talked about this is great. You want it because for a few reasons, one that you just mentioned is that, you know, he's going to get more plate appearances. And obviously like we talked about, you know, you can move him around and figure out your roster around him a lot easier, but sometimes a guy could be great for shortstop but his but his numbers for a second baseman which is a much deeper position than shortstop all of a sudden his numbers fall off how do you look at that when you're drafting yeah i think it depends especially because when you get this late in a draft you already have you know 90 percent of your team set up i think it depends on if you have a weakness in any of those spots so if i picked royce lewis early in the draft and i'm kind of worried okay if he does get injured again or has to miss a few weeks who's a good stop gap for him? Or, you know, even if I took Royce Lewis and another outfielder who may be a little, I may be hesitant on 
Luis Ranjifo or these dual eligible, triple quad eligible guys make so much sense because you can slide them in. And so when I'm paying attention to that, I'm paying attention to how have I already drafted and what holes might I need to fill? Um, and so that's kind of the first thing I attack once I look at my bench. All right. Keep going with a couple more sleepers here. So uh, go ahead. Yeah, I'll only I'll only do one more. I do want to touch on Gavin Lux. I think Gavin Lux could be a sleeper, but the one that I am kind of excited for is Jorge Polanco going to Seattle. He's currently going at 266, which is kind of surprising to me um, because the guy's got great power. Like, I think he could hit. I mean, so he hit 33 home runs in 2021, um, kept it up in 2022. So I could definitely see him hitting 30 home runs in Seattle. I mean, I know that it's a terrible ballpark, so that plays a part, and he's not going to steal a whole lot. But when you're talking at pick 266, why not take a gamble on somebody who's got some power? Because again, if I miss the boat on some of these high end second basemen, Jorge Polanco is one that could definitely jump up 100, 120 picks by this time next year if he's able to stay healthy because he's got 30 homer pop and he's going to hit the ball well. It's not like he strikes out at a huge clip. Um, let's see, his worst is. 25%. So he's got a good hit tool. He's got some power. I don't see why you wouldn't take the shot on him at 266. Clearly the Mariners thought that they had something with him. All he's got to do is stay healthy and he's, he's a star. All right. I, you mentioned Gavin Lux for a second. I just want to point out it's the same thing. You want guys who are on good teams, right? Yeah. And a guy who's not going to have a lot on him and say like, Hey, you're just going to be plugged into this lineup in the middle of the lineup or even if it's the back end of the lineup, and that can help you. Now, for me, I have a couple of guys. One um, who is a sleeper for me is a guy who is finally going to get full-time playing time on a bad team. And I, we talked about staying away from guys on a bad team. But this is different for me because he would be a guy that, like I said, is a waiver wire pickup or last pick in the draft. Something where this guy's probably not getting drafted in a lot of leagues. And all of a sudden you can pick him up and you're seeing consistent, you get 500, 600 at bats out of him. And actually when you look at his numbers, they're not that bad. He could hit maybe 15 home runs and bat 270 and also steal 20 bases. So that's Luis Garcia from the Washington nationals. He could all of a sudden turn into that guy that you want. He's not a great team, but he's going to play there every day. And so that's, that's a pick where if you get anything out of him, and you took him on the waiver wires, and all of a sudden you're getting some value out of him. To me, that's that's a huge plus. Anything would be a huge bonus. So that's like a heavy sleeper. And another guy, and we talked about this a little bit before we got on. And the one issue with him is his playing time. Uh, so it's almost the opposite of Luis Garcia's Jonathan India. There's a lot of guys there in Cincinnati, but he's a guy who's shown flashes, and much like Glaber Torres, in a different way, has had stretches where he's been really good but has been inconsistent. If he going into what an age 24, 25 season where that's the tech, the age where you put it all together. If he can put it all together, he can be a really good player and leave Cincinnati. No choice with like, Hey, you have to play this guy because he's been that good. Yeah. He's actually, I, I want to say he's going into his 27, 28, but Oh, I see what you're saying. I'm sorry. I think I misunderstood when he was 24, 25. Yep. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's a great call out. And, all it takes is one injury for him to get back to full playing time. The The Reds just signed him to a two-year deal, so he's staying there for the foreseeable future. It doesn't look like there's going to be a trade of any sort, so um, I think that's a good call-out. We just hope that he gets the playing time because if he only ends up with 400 at-bats, it's going to hurt, but if he gets close to 600, he's going to be a steal. So it's kind of a, it's a tough balance of, of how much do you think he's going to get, um, and I think that risk is baked into the price currently at, um, was it 211? I want to say, where do you go? Yeah, 221. So I think that's a good pick. Yeah. And when you mention a guy getting traded, talk about second base because it's so deep right now in fantasy that when you look across the league in Major League Baseball, sometimes you want to look at a guy who has the potential to get traded to a great team halfway through the season. And Jonathan India would be a perfect candidate, right? On a pretty palatable contract. If there's a team in dire need, a team that's in a pennant run and they think, oh, we're a second baseman away and Cincinnati's not doing anything. But when you look across the league and there's about all the top teams seem to have a really good second baseman, that doesn't really exist so much, does it? Yeah, I mean... The, the alternative is then he gets traded to a really bad team, but then he plays every day, right? And so it's just yep. kind of this weird balance of do you want a guy who's not going to play every day on a really good team or 
a guy who's going to play every day on a bad team. And obviously there's so many variables that, that get played into that, but um, yeah, I, I don't think he's going anywhere, but you know, we've seen some crazy trades happen, so I'm not going to speculate one way or another, but if it's me, I'm, I'm saying grab Jonathan and at that price. When you see a position this deep, do you generally stay away and say, okay, I can get guys later? Or is this a position you're jumping on? We're like, Hey, I still want the top guys. So that's a great question. Um, I think it does depend. And I've talked about this a few times with friends and just in other episodes um, with uh, on my other shows. It depends for me on the tiers. So like if I end up, let's just say some Mookie bets is going pick five. If I end up with the 10th overall pick and Mookie bets is still there for some reason, I'm taking him every time, right? So it's hard to say that I'm going to avoid a position or not avoid a position. I think it depends on how the draft falls. And if I can get one of the last guys in a tier and, you know, he's just been sitting on the board too long. Like if I'm at pick 40 and Marcus Simeon's still there, I'm taking him, right? And so it's hard to say I'm going to avoid the position. But if this is one that you don't find yourself getting a whole lot of shares of, if you don't end up with a second baseman by pick 150, I'm not too worried because there's quite a few guys later in this draft that are going to bring some value and have sleeper upside. Nolan Gorman's one. Um, Ed R. Julian's another one that's going to pop off, I think, and, and have a terrific year. Again, OBP League, he's moves up probably 50 picks for me. Um, Jorge Polanco. Like, there's tons of guys down there who bring value. So I, I want a second baseman because I think it is typically a tougher position. But if I don't end up with one, I'm not going to hit the panic button. So you mentioned the tiers. Let's go through the tiers. So your tier one is just Mookie Betts and Mookie alone. He's head and shoulders above everyone else. Yes. Yeah. It's again, not close. He's going top five. The next closest second baseman is um, they have Ozzy at 20 pick 23. So yeah, he's 20 picks ahead of everyone. He's tier one. God tier. So your tier two, your studs, and we'll, we'll do this every, every for every position. We'll talk about the God tier, the studs, the potential studs, safety matter slash consistency. So those are four tiers, and I love how you put those. So who are your studs for second base? The studs are the next three in ADP, Marcus Samian, Ozzy Albies, and Jose Altuve. Um, currently, according to most ADP, they actually have Ozzy Albies. Looks like he's going ahead of Marcus Simeon. I don't necessarily have a problem with that, but... I would prefer Marcus Simeon over Ozzy Albies. And I know that, you know if- what? I looked at Ozzy for, I was looking at him for bad value for a minute. Mm-hmm. I was like, he's so good that it's not, I don't want to put him in, but for where he's getting drafted, is he really that great that, you know, is he better than Simeon? Is he better than some of those other guys that he might get drafted ahead of when you look at broader positions, right? Not just second base. It's like, oh, wait, yeah. he might not be at the same level as some of those guys. And you could get a really good second baseman like we'll talk about in a minute here. Um, so I almost thought of him as a little bit overrated and a little bit of a not great value pick. But I was like, yeah, he's too good a player that at the end of the day, if you draft him, you're going to be happy with him. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a good call out. Um yeah, I think it's just part of Ozzy was such a hyped guy coming in. And when he suffered injuries um, last year, two years ago now, you know, everyone kind of was just like, OK, wait for him to come back. And he came back and he was phenomenal. So I think everyone's just ready to hop back on the train. And I understand that. And I am I have no problem draft. Like I said, if you take Ozzy at pick 25, I have no problem with that. But the reason that I want Marcus Simeon, I think this is important because this is just absolutely huge. The last five seasons, and I have the numbers right here, so I'm going to read them off. The last five seasons, and I'm going to exclude 2020, he has played in 159 games, 162 games, 162 games, 161 games, and 162 games. He has had over 700 plate appearances each of those five seasons. You just do not see that anywhere else. He hits a top, the one of the best, if not the best, offense in baseball. He's a lock for 100 runs. He's a lock for 25 home runs close to, if not 100 RBIs, he's going to get 15 steals. That's just not something that you can count on for Ozzy Albies. Ozzy might not even hit in the top five in that order for most days. I could see him hitting second. Um, I got to check his platoon splits, but last year he was hitting sixth quite a bit. So I'm just taking the the quote-unquote, nothing's guaranteed, but the guaranteed production, the everyday playing you're going to get from Marcus Simeon. They just don't build them like, like Marcus Simeon anymore to play every day. 
And you still have Jose Altuve in that studs tier because, like we talked about, he's still Jose Altuve and the consistency has been there. Yeah, yeah. He's, I think, like at the bottom of that tier. If I, but if I end up with him, I'm not going to be upset at all. I think he's still got plenty of potential. I think for the reasons I laid out earlier, I think a lot of people will be dropping him down their draft boards because maybe they want to get out that year early. But if he falls, I have no problem taking him because I think he's, you know, like you said, he's he's a he's got that dog in him, right? Sometimes yep. there's like things that you can't quantify. And I think Jose is one of those guys that just he's a competitor and being on such a great team and having that legacy that Houston has right now. That's just who doesn't want to compete. And they they keep it going right there. It's not mm-hmm. like they're going to fall off. But yeah, everyone's like, oh, I'd rather get out a year early than a year late. Sure. You don't want to be stuck with. Oh, wow. Now I have 33 year old small Jose Altuve who can't do anything. But I, I don't think that's going to happen this year. Now, potential studs. Yeah, guys you can be studs, there. and you love this guy. So I, I yeah. think I, I already know if I'm drafting and I'm around this point of the draft and I see you going for him, I'm going to try and steal him away from you because you've already mentioned him a few times. Who do you got? It is, yeah. So the only guy in this tier that I have is Matt McClain. Um, and if you look, so if you look at ADP, they actually show um, Nico Horner is getting drafted one pick or a half a pick above Matt McClain. And I'll talk about Nico in a sec, but. Matt McLean has the potential to jump up into that Simeon Altuve Albies tier next year. And so he is a potential stud. I think, I mean, he hits the ball hard. He's got great um, bat to ball skills. He doesn't or strike out a whole lot. Um, he's just, he's got it all. He's second base and shortstop eligible. He plays on a phenomenal team. And the cherry for me is that he plays in the best baseball park in, you know, the best park in baseball for, these fantasy stats, right? Great American ballpark is one a one B with Coors. So um, that's huge for me. And yeah, again, plays on a phenomenal team. The only caveat, the only reason why I didn't bump him up to the studs tier is because of that playing time. We mentioned, um, we just don't know how much he's going to get. If it's me, I'm penciling him in every day, but I think more realistically, if you're the reds, you want to probably keep him fresh and, and not play him every day. So yeah, I have him in this potential stud. Did you see this thing that uh, Buck Showalter was saying where he said guys would, I think it was on the foul territory podcast where he said uh, the general manager and and management and the analytics people would come to him and be like, Hey, um, you know, Nimmo hit a triple and a double yesterday. So he ran a lot. So uh, we're going to sit him today. It's like, wait, so I'm supposed to tell him that because he played well yesterday, he needs to sit. So do they, are they incentivized to not play well? Like, I don't understand how that works. It's crazy how that, you know, Buck, obviously, being an old school guy, didn't love that. But uh, yeah, it was just wild to hear him talk about that. Now, we have the safety and the consistency guys. This is the final tier. And you have uh, five guys or yeah, five guys here that you could just run through real real quick. uh, And then we'll get into a couple other things. Who are the five guys that in tier four? If you get one of these, I'm sure you're really happy with who you have. Yeah, yeah, and if you've already built a little bit of an offense and you just want kind of a, a safety guy, a guy that's just going to keep you afloat, which I think is is huge for fantasy baseball, I think that's exactly what you should be doing is finding these floor guys. Glaber Torres is one. I think that was a great call out by you. He's as consistent as they come. I think he's a phenomenal hitter. The second one is Nico Horner. Um, I think you know he's got a great glove that's going to keep him in the lineup, and he is one of the best bat-to-ball skilled guys in baseball he's going to hit for a high average i hope he continues to hit up top the cubs lineup we'll see there's a chance he could slide down a little bit um if they get a little better but um his glove's going to keep him in the field and his speed is phenomenal for the position he's probably one of the fastest if not the fastest second baseman um then i also have Catal Marte in this safety consistency tier um and i mentioned him earlier i think he's just a great value pick um, Bryson Stott is another one that doesn't get a whole lot of love and I'm not quite sure why he had a 15 30 season last year and kind of seemed to go under the radar but I absolutely think that there's more in the tank for Stott and I think at this time next year Stott could be a potential stud um, but I don't know if I necessarily see him going all the way up to stud tier um, but Stott's another one that's consistent and then the last one um, Ha Seong Kim I see him as kind of a Nico Horner light. They don't get too much power, although I think Kim gets to a little bit more than Nico. Um, Kim's going to steal a lot of bases. And we've talked about it, that eligibility is huge, and he is eligible at second, short, and third this year. That's a lot of positions he can fill up gaps for. So, 
if you do take Haas on Kim, you can be a little more flexible with how you draft later. Um, so yeah, those are my five guys for safety is Glaber, Nico, Ketel Marte, Bryson Stott, and Haas on Kim. Haas on Kim fell to me last year, either late, like really late in the draft, just an absolute steal. And the whole year I, I loved him. I plugged him in every position. Like you talked about, he was so, and you knew he was going to play. Like there was a time where he was playing first base. Also, I think for uh, out in San Diego, you just knew that he was going to get into the lineup. And like you said, there wasn't a ton of production when it came to power numbers, but he had enough and it's a pretty stacked lineup still. Um, so I do like that. Now, before we get to our top 10, because at the end of the day, that's what we got to do. We got to rank these guys. So before we get, and it's all the names we just said, but we'll just give you an order to them. Before we get to that top 10, we have a segment we're going to be doing on every episode for till the season starts because you are in some of those dynasty leagues. You've been doing this for a long time. You are very good at watching these players and probably have some of these guys already are rostered in your league because when you talk about young prospects coming up where if you're someone like me and it's May and I'm like, oh my God, this prospect came up and he's sick. Wow, that's crazy. But you're not watching closely for the last two, three years of him in the minor leagues and the hype around him. And you're not looking at the top 100 prospect league. They can catch you off guard. Our podcast is going to have you prepared for everything. So that's why Vinny is here with the Vinny's Prospect Report, sponsored by nobody currently, but we're open to sponsorships, obviously. Uh, so take it away, Vince. Who do you have as your prospect report for this year for second base? And I'm also going to give you uh, a couple of questions in there. And by the way, it could be someone, if you're in a dynasty league, this is draft this guy because he's going to be great in 2025. This could be draft someone right now because he's going to be great in 2024 or look out for this guy. He's going to be a call up in June or May and make sure you pick him up before anyone else does. So there's a variety. It swings here. There's no right or wrong when it comes to prospects, but just make us aware of some guys that maybe the rest of the average fantasy baseball players like myself are not aware of. Yeah. So I tried to stick to guys that will have an impact this year. Although, so I only, I drew up three guys and I think two of the three won't have much of an impact this year. Um, so I'll start with the one that will have an impact this year. And that is without a doubt, Joey Ortiz. Um, second base is typically a position that not a lot of guys in the minor leagues come up and just play second base. Like we do see it occasionally. Nico Horner was like that, but most of the second basemen in major leagues are shortstops who have moved off the position or even outfielders that we've seen move off the position because second base isn't as demanding of a position. So um, the reason why I picked Joey Ortiz is because this trade, I don't know if you know, but he just got traded from Baltimore to Milwaukee, right? In this DL hall move. That yep. is a massive, massive boost for his value. Um, if anyone hasn't caught up to the hype that um, Joey Ortiz brings, because currently he is going at pick 688. So practically free. And the guy is going to play every day. He's going to be their starting third baseman. And if the Brewers do move on from Willie Adamas, he's going to be their starting shortstop. Um, Joey Ortiz has a fantastic glove, so he's going to play every day. Um and he's not blocked anymore, right? There's opportunity. Which he was in Baltimore with all right. those great infielders, great young infielders that they have. Yes. Yeah. He hits the ball hard. He's got an above average speed. Um, he's got great contact rates, struck out at 17%, walk at 8%. Um, so he's not going to be like this guy who saves your season and brings your team into the championship, but he's definitely one to keep on your radar because if an injury mm -hmm. happens to one of your second basemen, um, it's fantastic because he's going to be playing third base. So he's going to get eligibility elsewhere, but he still has a second base eligibility from playing in Baltimore. Um, so he is definitely one that I want to keep an eye on. And I'm going to ask you this with every, every prospect you bring up. Sure. Give me a ceiling MLB comp. So we know what kind of guy we're looking at. I know you didn't write this down, so I'm putting you on the spot, but if you can give me just you know, when we look at prospects, a lot of times we're like, all right, who's a comp? Who's a guy that we can look at that's similar? If you could give me a comp that you think makes sense for Joey Ortiz, who would that be? Um, My my gut reaction was... And it doesn't even Bryce... have to be a second baseman. I was trying... Yeah, okay. But my gut reaction was like Bryson Stott last year. 
Um, I don't know, and let me just see. I can't remember if he is going to run as much as Stott is, but um, yeah, maybe not as much. So guy who hits for a good average, decent power, not much speed. Maybe, maybe a Tyro is no Tyro runs. It's kind of hard to compare him in second base position. I'll have to get, I'll have to think about that one because that's a, that's a good question for him um, as to who he might be comparable to. Um, yeah, I'll have to think. I feel about like it. everyone wants that, right? Like when we're looking at someone, well, okay, he's an unknown with prospects, but what can he be? You know, am I getting a Jose Altuve or am I getting, uh, like you said, a Bryson Stott? So that's that's kind of the range of people or a Glaber Torres or a different position. You go outside the position, you're saying, oh, this guy statistically is very comparable to, I don't know, to Paul Goldschmidt. You know what I mean? So, sure. yeah. Sure. Maybe, maybe in Jonathan India of the last couple of years. Um, right. Jonathan doesn't run a whole lot. He hits for decent power. And if he gets into a Milwaukee lineup that ends up being pretty good, he's going to score a lot of runs. Yep. Um, so I could see that being a, a close comparison. Um, but again, maybe India. Yeah. Cause India only ran, um, oh, that's 2022. He doesn't run a whole lot. So I would think maybe that's a close one. Jonathan India with a little less speed could be Joey Ortiz. Speaking of speed, do you think stolen bases kind of lose a little value with the new rules? I know there's the steals have been up across the league. Do you think now you could kind of steal steals to be corny about it anywhere? Because there's some guys who like Labor Torres, who was probably like a two to three steal guy, then all of a sudden jumps up to what a 15 steal guy. You see that happening across the league. Do you think that you could just pick up cheap steals elsewhere and now you don't have to worry about it? Or is it like, hey, the guys who are stealing 30 are now stealing 70, so you still need to look for guys who are going to get you a ton of steals? Yeah, I think it is more of that latter. Um, you you have to attack speed still, uh, maybe not as strongly as you used to, but you're absolutely right. I mean, if a guy has Ronald Acuna Jr. on his team, like you're probably not going to beat him in speed unless you have attack speed and and kind of a bobby witt um, corbin carroll something like that yeah, right right and if, if you miss out on one of those and that's why i would hate to be around like pick 10 11 12 because those top eight or nine i think are pretty set a lot of them bring speed um and you know then you don't have to attack early but if you have to take like a jordan alvarez or Corey seager a guy who doesn't bring you a lot of speed you're probably going to be crippled and you're going to have to attack it later in the draft so that's a great question yeah. You know what's interesting about that? We talk about the speed and we kind of mentioned his name on last episode, but JT Riamuto, his steals stayed consistent with what he does in his career. But considering the bump that everyone else got, do you look at that as kind of like he took a step back in the stolen base category? Who was the name you said? I'm sorry. JT Riamuto. Um, Let me pull up he... the numbers so that we're sure. not talking. Yeah. You know. Sure. Um, well, I think the the difference between Real Muto is the position, right? Like right. playing catcher, how many guys are going to steal 10 bases at all? And, uh, you know, Real Muto. Yeah, so he, for instance, he had, he had, you know, he had 13 and 21, 21 and 22, and then only 16 and 23, and was also thrown out five times, which is, you know, he was only thrown out once in 22. So his number took a step back. Mm -hmm. Only by five still gets you 16 stolen bases at the catcher position. But it's like, wait, now when we adjust what stolen bases are in Major League Baseball right now, 16 is not that many. For a guy who is 21, you would expect him to have 30, you know, the way mm -hmm. other guys were stealing, right? Yeah, yeah, that's a good. And, and it does maybe slightly worry you a little bit, right, with JT, because you hope the age doesn't come into effect here. Like, exactly. You know, is he starting to decline that way? Like, you know, he's just not going to run anymore. Um, but the one thing I will say about JT and the reason why he's safe is because he's got enough power and he's got a good enough hit tool to kind of outlast any of those. So if he doesn't steal you 20 bases, his ADP, you know, maybe doesn't turn out the value that you thought it might. I still think it's worth taking a shot on because his bat is going to play. He's going to be a good enough hitter. He's in a good team. So all of the other check boxes are there. So I wouldn't be too worried about a guy like JT for that, that case. All right. So you have a couple of other prospects for us before we hit our top 10. Who are those? So again, I'll be real quick here. Jace Jung is one of them. 
Um, I'm not sure if we see him this year, although I really, really, really do hope we see him this year. Um, I see him taking kind of like that Colt Keith-esque route that Colt Keith took this year, maybe next year. But if Detroit wants to compete, this is one of their better hitters in the system. Right now, he's kind of being blocked by Matt Vierling and, and Zach McKinstry, which they're fine baseball players, right? I think they're good depth pieces, but I don't think that they're going to be long-term starters, although I do, I'd do, i like them, but I like Jace Jung a lot more. He's one I would keep my eye out on because if one of those guys gets hurt, Vierling, McKinstry, one or both, I just I, I would be shocked if they didn't at least consider bringing up Jace Jung. So I think he's one to definitely keep your eye on. Um, and he's got the bloodlines, right? We've seen it with Josh Jung this year, right? They're yep. brothers. So um, he he hits the ball well. He's got a great plate approach. Um, and so I think he could take a huge step forward once he gets his playing time. Um, I don't know if you want to say anything about him. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I just remember when Josh Jung, for me, was the type of guy who came out of nowhere. You know, mm -hmm. I wasn't as locked in. And some people, yeah, of course. And I remember I met him last year, actually, at MLB Network. And that's cool. He, just a cool dude just walks in not a big guy either just kind of walks in carries himself kind of like he was just chilling like nobody i remember it's funny because the comp between him and the other guy pedro martinez now josh jung is bigger than pedro martinez but he came in with like a couple of friends maybe a girlfriend or something and everyone was kind of milling around the office and no one really paid attention to him pedro walked in alone and he's a tiny dude but the like the all of a sudden everyone turns their head and everyone's like, Oh my God, it's freaking Pedro. So it was kind of funny. Uh, but yeah, cause Josh Young to me was just this under the radar guy, but he was killing it last year. And it, it's a major part of that lineup that you talked about earlier when you were talking about Simeon is going to be mm -hmm. a, just a God lineup in, in Texas. Right. Yeah. And so that's actually, you mentioned he was kind of under the radar last year. If you are paying attention, I'm not saying you're not paying attention, but he definitely was I'm one of those guys. <laughs> he was one of those guys. I was not at all shocked. That's why I'm here in performance. Yes. Yeah, exactly. Because so he many just... people who, yeah, so many people in my league were like, yep, you know, if you're on prospects watch, you knew that this guy was happening. And that's why we're doing this prospect watch right now. And if you tell me that that guy has a brother who's going to get playing time, I'm like, yeah, I'm going to take him. I'm going to find a way to roster that guy. Yeah. Yeah. And again, he, you know, and this is where it's tough because I think other factors come in. It's not just who's the best player, right? They have financial considerations and, you know, um, contract obligations, things like that. So it's hard for him to maybe find playing time Jace Chung right now. But again, if one thing falls, you know, whether it's Veerling, McKinstry injury, or they just are not performing, definitely see Jace Chung getting in there. Um, and my last one is a similar story. It is Ryan Bliss of the Seattle Mariners. Um, guys got huge, huge pop and speed. He was hitting 358 in 68 games in double a just stupid numbers, 12 home runs, 30 steals, just like ridiculous stuff. Um, the only problem is now they have Jorge Polanco at second base and they're starting to try to bolster that offense a little bit more with major league talent. So I don't think he's going to get a shot right away, but he's going to probably play at AAA. He ended the year at AAA last year. He's going to start there again. If he is hitting like he was last year, I, I don't see I, – I see a world where they could bring him up part-time bat. So he's just one. His name's Ryan Bliss again. Just keep your eye on because, again, we've seen Jorge Polanco's injury history, and it's not always the greatest. So if he gets injured and Bliss is knocking down the door – I wouldn't be surprised to see Ryan Bliss get some starts. That's awesome. And so now we have our top 10 and we've look, this is your top 10 list. We've said all these names already. So now just put them in order for us. I mean, we wrote, there's not much to add for any of these guys. I think we've talked mm -hmm. about all of them, but if you could just give us one through 10, who is your top 10 at second base right now and follow this. This is your Bible. If you are drafting and you see that one of these guys is not taken yet, Follow this order because that's what's going to get you a win in fantasy baseball this year. Go ahead, Vince. Top 10. So at number one, I have Mookie Betts, obviously. Um, number two, Marcus Simeon. Number three, Ozzy Albies. Number four is Jose Altuve. Number five, Matt McClain. Number six, Glaber Torres. Number Love seven, that. See, Nico, that, that, yeah. for me, that's awesome. Like, perfect. Make him number absolutely. six. Yep. Yeah. He fits there. Great value. Um, mm -hmm. Some people are going to think Nico. That's fine. But I, I'm taking Glaber over Nico, unfortunately. Um, then seven, I have Nico Horner. Eight, Cattell Marte. Nine, Bryson Stott. 
and 10 Ha Seong Kim. Um, and I do want to mention when we start getting these articles pumped out, I am going to go a little bit deeper in as far as these rankings go, because a lot of leagues are bigger than 10 teams or, you know, maybe you want an extra guy on the bench. So I want to make sure people can get the content as far as, you know, who do I pick up after that? Um, I'll definitely be releasing some of those once we start doing these written articles. So keep a lookout for those. And I will also release the tier lists as well once those start coming out. Yeah, and that's where the sleepers and the tier list really come into play, where you start, okay, we're comparing different tiers. And when we start doing the the broader tiers from across the league, that's also going to really help because if you have a second baseman and a third baseman, but one's a weaker position, so how does that affect the tiers and everything? So um, we'll get to see that as, as we get closer to our drafts. But this is just episode one, or I should say the first episode for as far as positional rankings uh we're going to get into a lot of other positional uh rankings the one thing i did want to say before we leave um is we do have a fantasy baseball league you and i that we are in that you were so gracious to invite me to and we are looking for one more and so what we want to do is we want to do some sort of giveaway where if you figured out on social media when we'll post this also on social um through our twitter but if you follow us on twitter you subscribe to the podcast both on Spotify or, or Apple and then also subscribe and follow the podcast on YouTube. We will enter you in a giveaway and you are interested and good at fantasy baseball because that's, that's a key too. We will enter you in a giveaway to, or I shouldn't say a giveaway. We will choose one of you to join our fantasy baseball league and then you could be playing along with us as you listen to the show so that would be super cool uh for one of you guys so great idea uh for us to get more involved with the listeners like we talked about we wanted to make this a an experience across the board for all the listeners um so vince and i i thought that was a good idea to choose one of you to join our fantasy baseball league and it's another way for you to grow the podcast share it with a friend subscribe on youtube subscribe elsewhere and we appreciate everyone for listening so far and uh can't wait to keep doing this with you all right buddy yeah yeah i'm excited for it and um yeah hope uh hope we get to get some fan interaction and and learn about what they want to do and what they want as far as this podcast so yeah i'm excited now we haven't decided we haven't talked about this what position we'll do next and some of these we might double up if it's a if if it's a sh more shallow position we may double up there if it's outfield, for example, we'll have to go the full outfield. Where do you think you want to go next with position rankings? Do we keep up the number game and go third base? Let's third, go third base. Third Perfect. Base. Third base yeah, for third three. Episode. Yeah, we'll do it. So third base. And I think we'll probably end up doing it. It'll probably be a Monday episode. Um, mm -hmm. So look out for that. Until next time, I appreciate you all for listening. Vince, you want to send them off? I'm not as good at it. I don't know. How do I do that? I don't. I don't know. I haven't <laughs> see you have to have something. We have to come up with some sort of catchphrase or something like I did with mm -hmm. um <laughs> with uh, with my other podcast. It's a Jets podcast. And it's named after Rex Ryan. So I just play the clip of him saying, let's go get a goddamn snack, which is great. Um, <laughs> and That's that perfect. works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. Okay. Uh, because it's great. It's usually I'm feeling pretty snacky once an episode ends. I'm like, I just talked for an hour. I need to go get a snack uh here i don't know uh, it's got to be something fantasy baseball related uh go hit homers I, I don't know yeah go go in your league go i don't know draft there's a guy who i work with who has um uh no sweats winning bets and something like that i don't know he's like a betting guy so we'll have to know. think on that one i I, yeah. I don't know that's a good question well for now i'm putting you on the spot you, you're ending this so All however right. you do it yeah well, thank you everyone for listening. I, I appreciate it. And your listens will keep me coming back and please interact with this post and the podcast and the YouTube as much as you can like subscribe, all that stuff, because that's, what's going to keep us growing and keep us pumping out content. I'm super excited and grateful to be here. So um, yeah, thank you guys. And for anyone who's listening, let me know. Thanks. All right. Yeah. I was looking for something a little shorter, but all right, that works. <laughs> all right, oh, sorry. You guys. sorry. <laughs> no, no, we're good. That's perfect. All right. Uh, we'll talk to you guys on Monday. See ya.